If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. Jesus' final words. I have three points. Jesus' final invitation. His final invitation. Number two, his final blessing. There's seven blessings or beatitudes in the book of Revelation, and this is the seventh. And we tried to point them out as we went. And number three, his final warning. Folks, this is serious here now, all right? There's imminent danger ahead for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord. It would be like me knowing there's a bridge out. I have no signs. I have no way of warning people other than standing in the middle of the road. But yet people could drive right down, drive right by and go down uh, and lose their life at that. So we have to understand there is a final warning. You know, it's hard to believe that we have been studying Revelation for 15 months. This will be the 47th sermon we have preached in the book of Revelation. The last word of anyone is usually important, but the last words of the Bible and Jesus himself are extremely important. The overall thought of our final text is twofold. First, God's word tells us two times to come. That's the invitation to come. The second thought of Jesus, uh, thought of Jesus is I come quickly. So he's inviting you and he's telling you, do not wait. With the way things are going in our world, these two thoughts are the, of the utmost importance. Jesus is coming and Jesus is coming quickly. May we, we respond to Jesus' final words today before it's eternally too late. Jesus' final words, Revelation 22, 12. And notice it's in red writing, if you had red letters in your Bible, which means this is from Jesus himself. And behold, I am coming quickly. He said it in verse 7, and he'll say it again in verse 20. You repeat things a second time for emphasis. You repeat things three times that are utterly important. He's saying, because I know what people are saying, well, didn't he say that back in biblical days? Isn't that part of the prophecy that he has said before? And there's scoffers, Second Peter speaks of that. But I tell you, if, if, you know, and again, nobody knows when he's coming, but every bit of my being is saying, it will be soon. And we have to understand, Jesus is coming quickly. And it says, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So he starts out with the positive thing. All of us, if you are saved, all right, you will uh, receive a crown. And that is the crown of life. Everyone will have that who is saved. And then there's other crowns. Uh, that is listed. There's five crowns altogether listed in the Word of God. But the Bible also tells us if we even give a cold cup of water in His name, there is a reward. So we are not living for rewards. We are not living to find out who has the most. We are not living to say, hey, look what, look at my pile. Because as Lauren's saying, it's a biblical song, folks. All the awards we get, we are going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. It is our gift to him. And folks, it's so important that we understand this. Hold your finger there and go with me to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3 what he is taught, Jesus is talking about here. Look in verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom uh, you believe as the Lord gave each one? And folks, don't compare ministers to ministers, okay? Don't act like one is better than the other. I'm telling you, the guy that is in South Arkansas running 40 and being faithful to God is the same one that is in Little Rock running 2,000 in church. They are just as important. Okay, our assignments are only different. I planted, 
Apollos watered, but here it is, folks. Twice he says this, God gives the increase. Folks, I have never saved a person in my life. Never. I have no saving power. All I can do is give them the pure gospel. Then God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, convicts them of their sin, and that is why they are saved. God gives the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Even Paul described himself as the chiefest of sinners. Well, I got news for him. I'm right behind him, all right? Folks, I'm just telling you, we all have sinned. We all have come short of the glory of God. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are in God's field, and you are filled, and you are God's building. It's all about God, folks. It's all about Jesus. He is the reason we got up to go to church today. He is the reason we have abundant life. He is the reason we have hope and can look forward to living eternally in heaven with him. Verse 10, according to the grace which God was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. Folks, I'm telling you, I've been the pastor here for over 20 years. I have no clue how long God is going to leave me here on earth. If y'all will put up with me, I'm going to stay here till I retire. But somebody has to come in behind me. Somebody has to pick the mental, up, the mental up and move on. Nobody lives forever here on earth. But let each one take heed on how he builds it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the one who gave his life for you. Jesus Christ was the one that was raised from the dead and gives us victory over death. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Now, here it is. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, what are those things? These are things that can be heated up. And when you heat gold up and heat silver up, I'm telling you, it gets rid of the impurities in it. It's the word pure gold. And then it says there's three more things, wood, hay, straw, hay and straw. Each one's works will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Oh, folks, every one of us are going to stand before God. Every one of us is going to get of account of our life to God. And you have to realize, folks, our sins were paid for at the cross. He forgiven us of those sins. But from the day that we were saved on, we need to be workers in God's field, and there will be rewards. And this is what he's saying. If it's revealed by fire, uh, the things you do for God are gold, silver, and precious stones. Wood, hay, and straw will just literally burn up, burn up. And it says, because it was revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If any work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet through fire. And folks, I am telling you, as Lauren sang, uh, you know, we will, you know, I, 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 in my head, in my head of heads, I cannot fathom the first 90 seconds in heaven. I just can't hardly get it in my head because we are so worldly influenced. We are so fleshly driven. But folks, we are talking about a perfect place, perfect. And we get to give our rewards back to Jesus Christ himself. Now back in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
and the first and the last. We know alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and omega. So any word, anything, everything in our vocabulary, everything that we know is about Jesus. He began things. He was in creation according to John chapter 1. He is going to end all things, which we will speak about here in just a few minutes. He is the first and the last. So what is he talking about? He is talking about, Jesus is talking about his absolute authority. There's no one greater. There's no one greater. There's no one that has any more power. And remember, God and Jesus are one. And even when he was here, he says, I only do what God allows me to do or tells me to do. And really, this is, you know, six words of this is who I am. And you, let me tell you, and I know you know this, he is the only begotten son of God. Folks, that is so, so important. Now look down in verse 17. It ties in with these two verses. And the spirit and the bride says, come. This is the invitation. He's went all the way through the book of Revelation. Even now, you can walk all the way through the Word of God. And folks, the ending is important. When you get to the last chapter of a book, it sums up, and there's sometimes you read a book and it just almost shocks you. You, you just think, boy, I didn't see that coming. But I'm telling you, folks, Jesus is saying, I've warned you, and I've told you, and I've told you, and I've told you. I am coming. I am coming. Oh, Jesus is through the whole Old Testament. Jesus is what the New Testament is about. And so he says again, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. The bride is the church. It's our job to tell people about Jesus. It's our job to share the gospel with people around us. And Jesus tells us, come, let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirst say, come. And we know in the Beatitudes, all right, thirst is, is a thing of hunger and thirst for righteousness. If God is inside of you, it doesn't mean you always do the right thing. And we sin and we fail God. But 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we need to hunger and thirst for God. Whoever decides, let him take uh, the water of life freely. John chapter 7. Hold your finger there. John 7. The Bible tells us in John 7. Verse John 7, 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any one thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Oh, folks, it's just like the lady at the well. God was trying to give her a drink of spiritual water, and all she could think of was spiritual or, or, or uh, physical water. We need water, okay? You get hot, you want some water. Water quenches your thirst, but it cannot save you. Only Jesus can do that. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Oh, folks, the way you can know you're saved is knowing that the Holy Spirit is inside of you and you have a desire for godly things. Salvation. He is telling them one more time, come. Come to Jesus. So we see Jesus' final invitation. Also, number two, I want you to see Jesus' final blessing. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Blessed are those who do His commandments. Folks, it's one, one thing to know the Ten Commandments. And there's nothing wrong. I remember in vacation Bible school or sunbeams or one of those things way back then, we learned the Ten Commandments. All right? 
It's one thing to know it in your head and to practice them in your heart. Folks, it's one thing to be saved, but after you are saved, God wants you to be an obedient uh, servant. Obedience is the key to Christian life. Two keys. Obedience is one, and discipline is the other. I'm amazed as I watch athletes and how much time Olympic athletes put thousands of hours into training, sometimes for three minutes on a sprint. But yet, folks, we need to, we need to train spiritually. We need to be ready. We need to listen to the voice of God. We need to share the Word of God with others. Blessed, happy are those, the seventh beatitude, that they may have the right to the tree of light and life and enter into the gates of the city. Folks, we are walking through those pearly gates we talked about a few chapters ago. We are seeing God face to face for the first time. We are in our glorified bodies Thank God for glorified bodies. All right, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. I'm thinking you could eat and not gain weight. Isn't that going to be great? <laughs> Praise God. Now notice verse 15. But you always need to know why that word is there. That means there's a change in writing here. But outside or dogs. And when you think of that, we're not talking about your little pet Fifi here, okay? That's not what we're talking about. All right, it's an expression back in biblical days. And back in biblical days, dogs were scavengers. They hung out at the trash dumps. They lived off dead things and things that were rotten and things. So when you think of dogs, it's used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It means, uh, basically it means not real good people, okay? People that don't have a lot of rules. People that break the law, okay? But outside are dogs. He lists six kinds of people here. Sorcerers, anything to do with magic and the occult, okay? You have to watch the occult, folks. I'm telling you, your teenagers, you need filters on your televisions and on their phones. They will, things pop up. I am just telling you, you need to watch for those. Sexually immoral people, all right? Fornicators is on the list. Adulterers are on the list. It says, and murderers, and we have no problem, you know, the big two. Murder and adultery are the big two. And it says, and idolaters, anything, anybody that puts something before God, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Folks, Satan is the father of lies. And I have met people, I am telling you, and here's the truth, they don't know how to tell the truth. They have lied so long that they literally believe what they are saying is true, when in my heart of hearts, I know it's a lie. Folks, liars aren't getting in according to the Word of God. It doesn't mean if, you, if you've ever committed these sins, because it's always going to be asked, what about a murder? What about somebody uh, who goes to prison, is in prison? Well, the issue is he can get saved. He can uh, you know, get into ministry in the, in the prison, and he can be under the sound of the gospel, and God can you know, forgive him of that. I told you last week, there's only one sin that will not be forgiven of, and that's blasphemy of, of the Holy Spirit, rejecting God, saying no to Jesus. You will not be forgiven. And the key in these six, there was another group late earlier where there were eight listed there. And what it's saying is, if this is your lifestyle, as this is who you are, you're not getting into heaven. He will be outside the gates. And that's what it is saying there. Uh, John chapter 6. Go to John 6 with me if you would. John 6, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. What do you need today? What do you need today? I'm telling you, if you're here without Christ today, you need a Savior. You need to invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. And even Christians, I know you've already done this, but you have needs. Some people need to th- remember that, you know, they're, they're not as close to Christ as they used to be. They're not sharing the gospel with others around them. Whatever you need, Jesus has it. Verse 36, but I said to you that, that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me, and the ones who come to me I will no means cast out. Your name needs to be written in the Lamb's book of life. For I have come down from heaven, uh, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. Folks, God knows who is saved. Jesus knows who is saved. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool God or Jesus. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Folks, those two words, everlasting. You are going to spend all of eternity all of eternity in one or two places, according to Jesus' last words. You will spend it in heaven with Him because you trusted in Christ alone for your salvation. Or you have rejected Him and you will live forever in a place called hell. And people don't preach on that anymore. Folks, it's real. If you die without Christ, that's where you're going. I'm not trying to be harsh or mean or rude. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. There's still hope. Today, listen to me, could be your last invitation you ever said or stood through. You don't know that you have tomorrow. And we need to understand this is the end of Revelation. Jesus is begging you to come, come. And then it says, and I will raise him up in the last day. And folks, Jesus is waiting for you. Jesus wants to help you. Look at verse 16. I, Jesus, I, John, has been used earlier in Revelation, and this is the only place in the Bible Jesus identifies himself. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David. Jesus was before creation. Jesus, like God, always was. And it says, and the offspring. He was before David, all right? But he was also after David. What is he talking about? His deity first, and then his humanity. He was the God-man. He never sinned. And I've talked to people that just, that there is no way he lived on earth and never sinned. Well, you don't know what the Bible says if you say that. Jesus never sinned. He would not be the pure son of God, that sacrificial lamb, if he sinned one time. And it says, the root of David, the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. What is the bright and morning star? It's that last star you see right before daylight. I got news for you, folks. We're living in a dark world. It's dark. Okay, it's evil. But the star, Jesus, is coming. And he is coming soon. He is fixing the light this world up. And folks, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Now, the last point, Jesus' final warning. Look at verse 18. 
For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. What plagues? Well, you could go back to the Old Testament and know the 10 plagues that happened there. You could go to the bowls and the seals and the trumpet judgments, and you could look at that, and probably all of those are above. What is he saying? Don't mess with God's word. You have no right to change it. No right. And if you are truly saved, you won't change it. And I understand interpretation. I really do, folks. But you can, with one word, you can change the meaning of a sentence. And we need to, uh, we need to love the Word of God. We need to believe the Word of God. We need to say this word is yes uh, and amen. Folks, everything that we are, every doctrine that we believe, everything that happens in our life can be found in God's holy word. And it says, verse 19, and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. And it almost sounds like you can lose your salvation but what he is truly saying is, you were not saved. If you can change the Word of God, if, and, and you have to understand, especially in biblical days, there were false teachers everywhere. Well, I got news for you folks, there's still false teachers everywhere. They misinterpret the Word of God, and they change the Word of God to fit their lifestyle. And folks, we have to go by the Word of God. And he's saying, don't mess with the Word. And I know children can be children and youth can be youth, but it bothers me when a child is getting ready to do something, like they're going out to the gym and they're fixing to play ball, and they just drop their Bible on the floor. It takes all of my being not to say something. I don't want to offend a child. But folks, we need to teach our kids and our grandkids, you respect this book. You follow this book. You live in this book. You study this book. It's the holy word of God. And then verse 20, and he who testifies to these things, surely I am coming. Jesus' last words, surely I am coming the third time. Amen. What does amen mean? So be it. So be it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Man, if he came today, it would make me mad. I'd like to eat lunch first, but it's not necessary. All right, we could just go now. Wouldn't it be cool if during the invitation we hear the trumpet and boom, we're out of here. We're out of here. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know what he started the book with? Grace. Man sinned. Man rejected God, but yet God gave him grace. Jesus' own words. Jesus is saying, the grace is still here for you. Our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He said it twice. And if I could sum up in three words this last part, watch, wait, and witness. We need to be watching for his coming, folks. We need to wait on the Lord, and we need to witness. First Thessalonians 4, I read this, the first sermon that I preached in Revelation. I think we need to read it, the last words that we read. 1 Thessalonians 4. I know I'll get there sometime. Oh, there we go. 1 Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those that have died in front of us, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Folks, a Christian funeral ought to be a praise service. It ought to be a home-going service. It ought to be happy and clappy in Jesus. <laughs> For if we believe that Jesus died, folks, we believe. We believe 
and rose again, even so God will uh, bring them with him, those who even uh, who sleep in Jesus. Those who have died, folks, they're coming back with Jesus. With Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, we know who the Lord is, Jesus Christ, will descend from heaven with a shout. It's going to scare some Baptists, scare them to death, <laughs> that shout. With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the trumpet's going to scare them too. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Folks, we're out of here. We're gone. Praise God. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The invitation is simple today. Come. Come all through the Bible. You think about it. The word come is used all through the Bible. Jesus is waiting for you. If you are lost, Jesus are waiting, is waiting for you. If you are saved and need to rededicate your life, Jesus is waiting for you. If you need to uh, follow the Lord in baptism, Jesus says, come. If you want to move your membership and you've been saved and scripturally baptized, Jesus is saying, come. And I pray that we obey. We will listen today and obey the word of God. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the book of Revelation. God, I thank you so much for what it means. And God, the other word, when I hear the word come, I think of his words, I come quickly. God, I pray if there's one person here that doesn't know you, one person, that they will walk down this aisle and give their heart and their life to Jesus. God, I pray if there's Christians that have just kind of been down and really not having maybe the right attitude or just having, you know, just, just not totally being into things in the church and in the Word of God, I pray that they would come. God, this is your church. This is your time. And God, I thank you for one final word, and I thank you for giving us your last word and the last word is come god i pray that we would totally focus on this in jesus name we pray amen and amen would you stand to your feet if god has spoken to you in any way you come